Nobody knows how a mixture of lifeless chemicals spontaneously organize themselves into the first living cell. Paul Davies said, Nobody has a clue how life got started from non-living material by itself. There is not even a good theory how it can happen, but the textbooks are going to teach your kids it just happened, okay? They just tell them, hey, it happened. And you, don't, you can't even consider the option that maybe God made it. Here's what happened. Back in the 50s, two guys, Miller and Urey, decided to figure out how life evolved. So they took a mixture of chemicals and ran it through these tubes and tried to create life in the laboratory. The experiment's been duplicated many, many times, always been a failure and always created more problems for the evolutionist. This textbook says, uh, although he never had proved how life originated, he did add evidence to the theory that life could have started by itself. That is a lie. All they did was create problems for the idea that life could have started by itself. This one says, swirling in the waters of the oceans is a bubbling broth of complex chemicals. Progress from a complex chemical soup to a living organism is very slow. <laughs> oh, it sure is. It don't even happen. That's how slow it is. There are several different articles that say life came from clay. Yep, got some clay together and poof, came alive on the bottom of the ocean. They did not address the origin of uh, life in Darwin's book, and it's never been figured out since how life could have started. What he did is he took these four chemicals and put them in these uh, glass tubes, made them circulate around, and tried to create life in the laboratory. This textbook says, many important events occurred during the Archean era, the most important of which was the evolution of life. Progress from complex molecules to the simplest living organism was a very long process. <laughs> I guess so. If you give it billions of years, somehow it looks more reasonable, you know. This one says, the first living cells emerged between 4 billion and 3.8 billion years ago. There is no record of the event. But you better believe it and you're going to be tested on it. The first self-replicating systems must have emerged in this organic soup. So great, 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 great grandpa was soup. This is one of the lies in the textbooks your kids have to face. Nobody has a clue how life could have gotten started by non-living chemicals. Even Haeckel confessed, he's the guy we talked about in the last session, uh, that made up the idea that the embryo has gill slits, you know, so they could justify abortion. Haeckel said, he claimed that spontaneous generation must be true, not because it had been proven in the laboratory, but because otherwise it would be necessary to believe in a creator. Well, Ernst, I'm sorry, bud, that's just the way it goes. Okay, there's a creator, whether you like it or not, okay? So have they really produced life in the laboratory? Oh, they haven't even come close. Here's what they did. They took four gases. They took methane, ammonia, water vapor, and hydrogen, ran them through these tubes, ran it through a spark chamber to supposed to simulate lightning. <clears throat> and they say, we're going to see, we're going to put them together and make life in the laboratory. At the bottom of the flask, they got this red goo, and they kept draining the goo off because if it went through the spark again, it would destroy it. So they had to make the goo and then save it from the next spark, okay? They said in the textbook here it was rich in amino acids, this red goo was. Well, that's simply a lie, okay? They didn't come close to making life. The problem is they had a reducing atmosphere. In other words, he excluded oxygen. You can look at his four gases. There's no oxygen there. He knew if he had oxygen in there, it would oxidize whatever chemicals tried to combine. You know, you cut a banana open and lay it on the table, it turns brown, it oxidizes. You don't paint your car and it oxidizes, it rusts. Well, living, living cells will, try will oxidize quickly in the presence of oxygen. So he didn't put any oxygen in there. That creates a serious problem because if you, if you have oxygen, you cannot get life to come from non-living chemicals. The problem is ozone is made from oxygen, and ozone blocks UV light, and UV light destroys ammonia, and ammonia is one of the four gases he's got. So you cannot get life to evolve with oxygen, and you cannot get life to evolve without oxygen. Because if you don't have oxygen, you don't have ozone, and now your ammonia gets destroyed. It's just not going to work either way. And the earth has always had oxygen, even more than today. This guy said, what evidence is there for a primitive methane ammonia atmosphere on earth? The answer is there is no evidence for it, but much against it. We find in general no evidence in the sedimentary distribution of carbon, sulfur, uranium, etc., of an oxygen-free atmosphere ever existed on the earth. If somebody tells you the early earth had a reducing atmosphere, you tell them Kent Hovind said they're confused or they're deliberately lying because it's not true. The earth has always had oxygen. This article said, it's suggested from the earliest dated rocks at 3.7 billion years ago, earth had an oxygenic atmosphere. They've always known the earth had oxygen, even more than we have today. We covered that on seminar part two, how the early earth probably had even more oxygen, made them live longer. This textbook says, there was no oxygen on the earth, which is a lie. And then it says, the rocks absorbed it. <laughs> Hello? <laughs> uh, 
How can they absorb it if it wasn't there? Well, think about it. Second problem they had with the Miller experiment, they filtered out the product. That is not realistic for nature, okay? They saved the goo from getting sparked the second time because it would have destroyed it. What he actually made in this experiment was 85% tar, 13% carboxylic acid. Now, both of those are poisonous to life. If you make a mixture that's 98% poisonous to the other 2%, I don't think it's logical to say you've succeeded in creating anything that's going to help make life, okay? The problems are he made mostly only two amino acids. There are 20 different ones required to make life. 20 different amino acids. Now, these amino acids are kind of like letters of the alphabet, okay? You have to have 26 letters in the English alphabet to make all the words that we have. Well, you have to have 20 different amino acids to make all the proteins that your body has. With those 20 different amino acids, your body can build a bazillion different kinds of proteins. Kind of like you can make a lot of different words with the same 26 letters, okay? What he actually made was a couple of letters, like two of the letters of the alphabet, by combining these gases. This creates a real problem since half of them were left-handed and half of them were right-handed. What he actually made was amino acids, only two of them, and half of them were backwards. I mean, if I drop letters of the alphabet, there's a 50-50 chance some of them are going to land upside down. They don't do any good. You have to have them all facing the right way. The smallest proteins we know of have about 70 to 100 amino acids, all of them facing the right way. This greatly compounds the problem, okay? DNA and RNA are all right-handed. All other proteins are left-handed. It's a very puzzling fact. All proteins that have been investigated from animals, plants, and higher organisms, and from simple organisms, bacteria, molds, even viruses, are made of left-handed amino acids. They're all that way. So he's really got a problem since half of his letters were backwards. And there are hundreds of amino acids required to combine in just the right way to make a protein. And they unbond in water faster than they bond. And they claim this all happened in the oceans. Well, the oceans are completely full of water all the way to the bottom. And Brownian motion is going to drive them apart. It's not going to put them together. One of the lies in the textbooks is that they made life in the laboratory. They have all they've done. Every experiment has made the problem worse for the evolutionist, okay? The spontaneous generations do not occur spontaneously in water. Life is not going to get started in this way. There's a whole lot more in the book, Icons of Evolution, if you want a lot more on the subject to go down deep. But they got this weird idea in their head that all they have to do is get all the right chemicals together and then add energy and it'll make life. Okay, well, let's do an experiment. Let's put a frog in a blender and turn it on. In a matter of moments, you will have frog nog. And you will have all of the chemicals required to make a frog in one blender, right? Then we're going to add energy. You can turn it on puree for 30 minutes. You can nuke it, microwave it, zap it with jumper cables. I don't care what you do. Drop a hand grenade in there. Add all the energy you want, okay? How long will it take to reassemble the frog? It'll never happen. See, just getting the chemicals together isn't the problem. You go to the mortuary, you got a dead body laying there, you got all the chemicals required for life right there in one spot. Bring it back to life. Life is something different. I don't think science has ever defined that clearly, but they talk about how we all came from this early life form. Once this first life form got started, this single cell, then it evolved into everything else. Like this textbook shows the kids that a bacteria slowly evolved to a human. These trees of life are absolute propaganda. There is no evidence for any of these, okay? Even Mary Leakey said, those trees of life with the branches of our ancestors, that's a lot of nonsense, okay? Hey, Stephen Gould said, the evolutionary trees that adorn our textbooks are not the evidence of fossils, that's for sure. There is no evidence that any animal is related to any other kind of animal. But this textbook says, all the many forms of life on earth today are descended from a common ancestor found in a population of primitive unicellular organisms. There's no such thing as a primitive unicellular organism. If it's alive, it's complicated. We'll cover more on that in a minute. And then it says, no traces of those events remain. What they do is they tell the kids, okay kids, the mammals, the birds, and the crocodiles have a common ancestor. They draw these trees in the books, and they look so pretty, and the kid goes, wow, they've got proof. I saw it in my book. <laughs> no, they've got a picture in your book, okay? Everything inside that circle is pure religious speculation. They think it happened, they hope it happened, but there is zero evidence for anything inside that circle. It's one of the lies you're going to have to face in your textbook.